The British historian Arnold Toynbee is rather neglected now in the mainstream media, but a bit like Oswald Spengler, I think he's an historian who will come back into our minds because he was interested in history not just as a series of causes and effects one damn thing after another which for all its interest and colour is generally how history is told today rather Toynbee was interested in the inner dynamics of history as well trying to identify the spirit that was unfolding in different moments in different civilizations. And so, as our modern society faces its many crises, that inner dynamic will become of interest as much as the external technological solutions that people try to derive to face climate change, pandemics and the like. Toynbee reckoned that the life of individuals and societies or civilizations unfold across processes of what he called etherealization, by which he meant the tensions between the external dynamics that shape things and the inner impulses that form them too, and that through different periods across a life, the external will dominate in one period, but then reach its own contradictions and failures and there'll be a need to turn to the inner and to sink new roots, develop new insights, find new wellsprings to renew the life. So the example he uses is the phenomenon of roads that at first is an external challenge how to gain the technology to build them but then once road building has been achieved with ease, say with the development of modern tarmac roads, it then becomes an inner challenge because you have to work out how to govern and educate people about how to use roads. Speed, for example, wasn't a problem in Roman times because the technology of roads limited the speed that they could be traversed, but with tarmac in principle, roads could be travelled at very great speed, and that meant that human beings became a danger to each other on the roads. And so then the challenge becomes a psychological one of how to teach people road discipline, which is partly enforced by laws, of course, but must primarily be one that people discipline from within themselves, so they follow speed limits, so they would look out for others, um, and so they get some sense of danger on the roads. And then the same thing can be said to happen at civilizational levels as well. One that he turned to because it's become famous in the Western mind is the rise and then decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which he saw as, in the first instance, the gains of huge advances in terms of technologies, both political, cultural and practical, and hence the Roman Empire could spread around the Mediterranean world. But then this threw up internal contradictions and crises because with the Roman Empire came increasing numbers of Roman citizens, individuals that wanted to enjoy the freedom of the empire. And so that required a set of inner reflections on the nature of the individual and how to exercise that freedom. And Christianity that had been growing through this period of crisis was in the wings to appear and that gave a new ontological foundation for the individual, in principle all individuals, who are made in the image of God and so can find a living ground from which to draw all that's required to live in a wide society and so can renew old moral codes and make them into the virtues that enable an individual to flourish within a wider society. Interestingly to me, Toynbee uses the case of Dante to describe such a process where individual crises meet social crises and one particular genius comes up with a response. 
and Dante's Divine Comedy was such an example for Toynbee. Dante living in this time of extraordinary external expansion of his hometown Florence with the birth of mercantilism and then also banking that enabled the accumulation of wealth and the growth of trade but then this bringing its own internal contradictions with the emergence of an underclass and also the warfare that was precipitated by the stresses and strains of political government. And so Dante's life becomes an embodiment of these tensions. He himself in the first part of his life trying to succeed in the external dynamics of his times then falling foul of the wars, being sent into exile, and so having to reuse his tremendous talents to develop a new inner response to his times, of which the Divine Comedy is the great product. And so Dante becomes an example for Toynbee of the type of person who helps their times and place move from the crisis of an overexpanded external life through the renewal of inner life, typically by withdrawing from society and then returning to it with the product of their exile. He sees this happening particularly in what are called the axial figures. So for example, the figure of Lao Tzu in ancient China is someone who withdraws from society seeing the excesses of the Confucian state remakes inner life and so enables Chinese culture to renew itself with an amalgam of Taoist and Confucian thought. He sees the same thing happening in the Indian civilization with the Buddha withdrawing from his life of external privilege in order to remake what humans might aspire to, again through parallel processes of what you might call self-salvation, working out what it means to be human in relation to the cosmos and bringing back that back to renew, well, both what we now call Hinduism as well as forming Buddhism as well. He sees the same happening in ancient Greece with Socrates responding to the crises of the Athenian Empire by asking these questions that forced the individual to consider what the good life might be, what justice might be, what friendship might be, which provides the resources with which Greek culture and civilization could be renewed via the renewal of individuals within it that create a new consciousness that can then be expressed in political, economic, religious and social forms. This is how Toynbee understands the movement between the external and the internal for the individual, for societies, and that the crisis must be born in order that renewal can be found. And it speaks, of course, very much to our own times where it feels as if we are at the point in the cycle where the external expansion has ceased to be sustainable in terms of the damage done upon the external environment. And whilst an impulse will be powerfully felt to continue to try to solve those problems with external technocratic fixes, because the technology has been so successful to this point. The crisis under Toynbee's analysis is actually prompting a return to inner considerations. What's happened actually is that the external manifestations of modern society have outgrown the internal sophistication and nuance of our times. And so we don't have the wisdom with which to live in our times and so the crisis will prompt at least in some an effort to remake our inner life. Toynbee reckons that the places to look for this are at the margins 
are in the exiles, are amongst those who feel the need to withdraw or are forced to withdraw from wider society. So, for example, I think both Western Christianity and materialist philosophy alike won't provide the resources for this renewal. Western Christianity is very closely associated in spirit with the expansion of the modern world, the drive to spread trading routes, for example, around India was closely associated with the drive to convert people to Christianity. And you feel that spirit still very much alive within Western Christianity, even as it declines, the response is the old impulse to try and make new Christians, more Christians once again. And similarly with materialist philosophy, it too is very closely aligned with the growth of the Western world in its material forms. It provided the philosophy that put the trust in the machine that led to the expansion. And so philosophers of a materialist persuasion are likely to continue to argue for the utility of the machine in order to meet the growing crises. And no doubt that will provide some responses that with luck help ameliorate the suffering but there will always be this sense that it's playing catch-up that it's not really getting at the roots of the problem and for that Toynbee would advise turning to those on the margins those who find themselves in exile now this is no easy or quick response to the challenges of a time it only starts to emerge in its mature forms across several generations and so in the meantime as we see now there is an explosion of attempts to respond to the crisis and this produces what Charles Taylor the philosopher has called a supernova for example of religious experiments be that in the so-called new age in therapeutic approaches even in forms of Christianity such as the charismatic and similarly in the political sphere as well you see all sorts of experiments that maybe give birth to, for example, conspiracy theories, renegade leaders, patterns of behaviour that are hard for the old modes of democratic life, in the case of the West, to embrace and to understand. And I think that the way to respond to this confusion now is to look for those who were responding to it and have survived in terms of maintaining their cultural or spiritual presence in the centuries since they were writing and engaging with their times. It's why I, for example, feel that Dante has powerful and clear things to say to us now because there has been 700 years of putting his response to the test this is not about going back to what Dante talks about directly, but it's about using the Divine Comedy in particular to catalyse and inspire responses to our now. I've talked about that on other occasions, even at book length, and there is much more gold in that seam to mine. But think too of another figure who was himself greatly inspired by Dante, of William Blake. Now he lives in another period of extraordinary industrial growth in the modern period and sees the tensions which he felt were becoming apparent in the dark satanic mills, the industrial processes that sucked people in and spewed cotton out but also sucked ideas in and spewed out the empiricist philosophy that so much drives late capitalism now. He's a figure who also faced a kind of exile, both in terms of his religion and society, being a nonconformist, and also in terms of his vocation. His artwork was never accepted in his own times for all that he hugely yearned for it to be recognised and only in the last part of his life became reconciled, I think, to the fact that he was going to speak to a future age. 
notably ours. And just to pick up on a couple of things that he has to say, by turning to the last section of his great epic, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, because it's there that he portrays a figure of renewal after the crisis that he so powerfully portrays, explores in the first part of the poem when Albion turns his back on his inner life, his divine vitality in the form of Jerusalem and says, no, everything is mine and eventually dies. But renewal comes when the inner dynamics have been explored and understood. Loss, for example, who never gives up on the struggle to keep contact with the divine imagination, to stay within the processes of creativity, not merely blind expansion. He's celebrated at the end of the poem. He is said to have never given up on the divine vision. Interestingly, for all the mistakes he makes, he wrestles for a lot of the poem to build Golganuza, a heavenly place on earth. And this fails, as inevitably it must, which in Toynbee's terms is because loss tries to compete with the dominant external manifestations of the times. He is at his anvil trying to build Golganuza when the dark satanic mills are always going to outpace and obliterate his efforts. But what Loss realises when he smashes his spectre, as Blake puts it, which had told him to compete at the technological game as if he could outcompete the forces around him, is that an inner renewal is possible. And Blake portrays this when Albion himself hurls himself into the furnaces of affliction, instead of turning his back on what's going so wrong, turns towards them. And in the very acceptance of the destruction, the death of the times, Blake describes how the fiery furnaces turn into fountains of living water by facing the tragedy, by being honest, about the destruction it brings and feeling the full emotional and spiritual impact of that spontaneously within the human heart which is also divine springs up a response that is a renewed vision and purpose blake describes this as seeing how bacon newton and locke join hands with milton shakespeare and chaucer and what he means by this is something quite subtle that Whereas taken in isolation, the philosophies of Bacon, Newton and Locke, the empiricist material philosophy, lead to the tragedy. When they can join hands with the creative and imaginative spirit of Milton, Shakespeare and Chaucer, they are able to remake the society once more. Again, in Toynbee's terms, the external dynamics recover their connection with the inner life, and so a period of renewal can begin. Blake talks about creating space, creating time according to the divine wonders of the human imagination. It's not the materialistic imagination that is collapsing space and time. When life is participated in, even if by throwing oneself into the furnaces of affliction, even if by letting Golga Nusa go, that brings us in contact with the divine wonders of the human imagination once again, which was always there, but gets excluded or occluded by the dominance of Bacon, Newton and Locke. And so I think this means quite directly that there's a necessity to tell a new history of our species that's not driven by utilitarian concerns for struggle, expansion and survival, although that is very much the dominant orthodoxy of our times, but perhaps to turn to figures like Toynbee and Spengler once again, noticing what they get wrong as much as what they get right, but it's the spirit of their engagement with history that matters, that's looking for the inner dynamics because the external has become so exhausted. It can be played out in other parts of life as well. Take 
moral theory, I think that the attempt to explain all morals through evolutionary psychology is too part of this technocratic approach of struggle and survival. And instead, we must begin to recognise that we have moral compasses, that we have a feeling for what's good, beautiful and true in life. And that developing the virtues that can become sophisticated about that are what would lead to renewal, not just the endless, sprawling, often ridiculous accounts of our inner life given by, say, evolutionary psychology. And it also means trying to tell another story that can counter the corporate future envisaged in, say, virtual universes, the metaverse, as if our inner life will be satisfied by unlimited, boundless possibilities for consumption, and realising that the human face matters, that actual contact with nature is what brings renewal, that tangible wealth rather than abstract or virtual wealth is what appeals to the human spirit from the inside out. Blake offers an ethic of this which he sums up in the Christian insight that man is love as God is love as he summarises it. And what Blake means by this love is the ability to say yes to all that's embodied in the figure he calls loss who is both full of the imaginative impulse but often impulsive at times and so makes terrible mistakes but those mistakes in this love can always be met by forgiveness which enables loss never to lose touch with the divine vision always be able to begin again and also makes for the society that can embrace the mistakes and errors of others Blake remarks that every kindness is a little death, by which he means ensuring the freedom of others to make their mistakes requires us to put to death the impulsive selfhood, as he calls it, which would otherwise just react to them. And that's important because altogether that creates the crucible or container for the birth of a renewed wisdom that understands inner life afresh, that experiencing the exile of now, feeling the furnaces of affliction, is to say yes to our moment in history as Toynbee and others have understood it, when the great expansive external forces of our age have become destructive, have become exhausted, because that is to know our moment is also one in which a renewed inner vision might be born if we can turn to figures like Blake, to figures like Dante, in order to try and detect the fountains that might be welling up beneath the flames.